Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food podcast with your hosts, Brian Cole and best selling author, N.D. Wilson. This audio is brought to you by Cannonball Books and Great Homeschool Conventions. Okay, we're starting this episode with Brian Cole making a confession that he's been lying to people at conferences. <laughs> yeah, you know. Tell us these yeah, lies, Brian. Sometimes people will say they have an adverse reaction to fantasy. Right. Term. A lot of people do, in fact. I think, and we've talked about that before. It's reacting to the taste of like a, a bad fantasy novel, I think. and I think it's reacting to their self-perception and their own insecurities. Interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm you, not even joking. Those of you that I've lied to are about to find out more <laughs> more about yourselves than you wanted to know. What What do you mean there? Why think, don't Why do you think someone comes up to me at a conference and says, "I just don't like fantasy"? Well, you don't think it's because they've read a bad fantasy novel? And I thought, think it's I think it's because of personal problems. Okay, so it's not that they don't like the silly names and the dragons. I think that could be part of it. That's where vanity comes into play. So, and I'm not necessarily always in a bad way, but it's, uh, it's basically an inability to process the world that, in which they live. It's a, it's oh, a, okay. So the people who, cause they don't, they think they're okay. This takes me back to our sci-fi discussion. Is that what you mean? Where? So, people, yeah, exactly. But think about picture, if you will, uh, Samwise Gamgee coming up to you at a conference and telling you that he doesn't like fantasy. And you'd say, but you're in but, one. <laughs> you're in, be like, wait, you're in, in the greatest wait one. Wait <laughs> a second. And except for it's, it's more like Sharky at the end of Lord of the Rings banning fantasy. You know, it's. Okay. And other people responding to that ban, other little, you know, little hobbits and other middle, middle earthian, other middle earthers uh, obeying that ban and saying, yeah, we too, I guess we shouldn't like fantasy. Hmm. So when somebody comes up to me and says they don't like fantasy, I, I am frozen in a moment in time staring at a fantasy creature who's telling me that they don't like fantasy that's a pot saying i don't like the potter yeah it's yeah it's just weird the whole it's just really really i guess that does fit and i just haven't realized that before because it's never it's the people who tell me as a rule i don't like fantasy you are never people who strike me as those who've read a ton of books they yeah they it's not that they've read widely and discovered that they don't like the flavor of the genre it's that they have a completely flawed self-perception, a completely flawed view of the world, a completely flawed view of God, and they're standing there in front of you as if we're, we all live in some kind of syllogism and not understanding that they're being sucked down onto a ball of mostly lava going Mach 86 around a star while they say that. So uh, next time they tell me that, I need to tell them, your imagination is weak. Yeah. <laughs> Just say, you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and that Um, because if they say i prefer realism as long as that realism doesn't pretend like it's fantasy as long as that realism doesn't pretend like it's in a fantasy world i prefer books that say they're realistic and by that i mean books that are not realistic at all right that's what they're saying as you said before books in which birds do not poop protein balls out of their behinds (laughs) (laughs) for us to eat (laughs) yes i wouldn't say poop i think it's incorrect Drop. <laughs> no. There we go. Drop. Or wait, what's the word I'm looking for? Lay. <laughs> Lay the protein ball out of their uh, mind. Yeah, the, the orb of protein. Um, yeah, it's just a complete lack of self-awareness. It's a complete lack of the Bible, It's uh, like of understanding of the Bible, a complete lack of understanding reality. It's like it's, these are the people who wouldn't believe that butterflies were real. Okay. You know, if you just didn't give them access to their elementary school education, they They're, would, they would yeah. deny it. Absolutely. They have no ability to envision a wriggling corpulent worm turning into a brightly colored flying object right in this world which you know i don't know if you know this happens yeah okay so they're the kind of <laughs> people to happen. they're the kind of people who wouldn't like a story about a dinosaur if they hadn't had a million scientists telling them about how natural and normal it is they're the kind of people who wouldn't like a story about the dinosaur if you changed the names to something more fitting leviathan like leviathan behemoth gotcha oh uh, they will only like those things. They only color inside the lines that are established and drawn by people who deny the nature of the world and the nature of the world's creator. Well, there we go. We've come out swinging, sad. swinging hard at all the people that I have misinformed. All the people that Brian's lied to. Yeah. So, because Lee, it is inter- this does tie in because Lee Pike is my 
non-fantasy. Yeah, so that's where that ties in. I say, oh, you don't like fantasy, you will read still like one. Nate, you should read Lee Pike. I think that's great. I appreciate. I still appreciate you doing that. Because that is a, ga it's a gateway drug, for yeah. sure. Right. And it's, uh, Lee Pike Ridge is not a fantasy, but again, it is. It's bad. I mean, it's got plenty of magic. Neither is Holes, the book Holes of, of fantasy, and yet it's fantastical. Right. But the costuming, the location, the level of uh, how far out on the bell curve you are in terms of powers and abilities and things like that, in that in those senses, in those terms, then Lee Pike is not fantasy. Right. So Lee Pike Ridge is the story of a boy who finds a chunk of styrofoam and floats down a creek on it yeah. and falls asleep and then gets sucked into a cave when the creek dies, dives underwater, underground, and sorry, and is stuck down there for a long time uncovering the the secrets and the mysteries and the histories of the world. The first part about getting sucked under the mountain is the part that I use at the conference, and that usually and you stop. Right there, yeah, it's like okay, right there. there we go. Read this. So if you haven't, I really do. This obviously Lee Pike is Nate's, Nate's debut, the Debut novel. Yeah, it it was my debut novel. I'd already written the first draft of the One Hundred Cupboard series when I wrote Lee Pike, but it was the first novel I sold, and it was the first. Well, that's not quite fair. It was the first because it was one multi book deal, but it was the first novel published. May of 2007, May 22nd, I believe. Yeah. We just passed its birthday. Okay. And I think you've said things in the past about how all your books are integrated. Yeah. Do we have to do the work on our own to figure out how Lee Pike integrates? I have, I have a question from Spencer W. who's asking, are there more crossover books that will integrate Lee sure. Pike Ridge and Boys of Blur coming from you? Yeah, I think Boys of Blur is already integrated. Lee Pike Ridge is, is there. You know, there is a point of integration, but it's also... One of the, it's like, imagine a story written by Rowling about a muggle. Right. You know, in that world, but, you know, following a, a muggle adventure in which he discovers that the world is a lot more complicated and interesting than he realized, a lot more yeah. magical. And so there's the Lee Pike actually is very, is very funny because there's, there's quotes from my books that get pulled and they show up on quote generators and they, you know, they show up on a lot of inspirational posters or they get read at funerals or, you know, it's just, it's interesting to see where different lines and line sentences actually go live. Uh, the, one of the most quoted is from Lee Pike Ridge, but description of the moon. And it's actually a very simple little description, but it just goes and goes and goes. The moon was up painting the world silver, making everything look just a little bit more alive. And for some reason that just is everywhere yeah. <laughs> that, on a lot of bad art. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a lot of terrible art, but it's, it's there. It's rubber stamped with yeah, Andy Wilson. Yeah, so as a sidebar, this is totally unrelated, but just to prove that there is an author and he's writing this story, on the day recently, in the not too distant past, when I had to have my gallbladder ripped out of my stomach because it would have killed me otherwise. In betrayal, my, betrayal from within. Yeah, on that very day, my brother-in-law opened his day planner, which he has a physical day planner, and there was a quote from me. <laughs> an inspirational quote from me at the top wait when he a day planner he purchased from like from amazon or whatever yeah okay so he had a day planner and he turned the page to that day and there was a quote from yours truly at the top of the page which he texted me a picture of and it was everything gets harder if you start going on and on about how hard it is <laughs> well you're about to have surgery <laughs> <laughs> and it was my surgery day while i was in getting my gallbladder out it wasn't the moon quote. It was that quote. It was that quote particularly that was in his day planner for that for the day of my disembowelment. <laughs> for some reason, God, you didn't knew you didn't need a, a a pretty moon metaphor. Yeah, it wasn't time for the pretty moon on that day. It was a suck it up buttercup kind of a yeah. kind of a day. I know you're complaining about the the gallbladder <laughs> right now, or at least so. Anyway, that was to. that was the side. That's the sidebar. So back back, back to, to the editorial sidebar. Yeah, when you wrote that line, right. Uh, are you, does that line come out as you're writing or is that something that comes in later and you're thinking, you know what, I need a beat, a descriptive beat to help this scene pop more? Or... That line came out in the writing, but there are often, that's one of the things you look for when you go back through and you edit is, have I set the tone correctly? Yeah. Uh, is the, the music of the scene, is the music of the description fitting? Is it actually suiting the tone you're trying to accomplish with the narrative right there? Or can people not see it? Have you failed to light? Right. Your, have you failed to light your set? You know. Yeah. I think new authors often misunderstand because they'll try to do the moon thing 
every paragraph, like right. what you did. Yeah. And then when you're reading the draft, you're thinking, I, I, listen, I didn't lose track of the moon. Right. Just tell me the story. Yeah. So just writing last night, writing a chapter of another, closing the ch another chapter of the Silent Bells serial, I was realizing like, okay, so here's a, I'm dropping a pin where it's like, okay, I've under, I've under described this character situation physically. Yeah. I've under described where he is, what he's wearing, what he's doing, really what he's wearing and how he's feeling and you know, yeah. all that stuff for too long. And so you reinsert it, but you also kind of flag it. Like when I, when I go back from the beginning, when I, when I come back through this whole novel, I'm gonna have to make sure I keep track of that. Right. You know, keep track of. Cause it makes a lot of sense in a serial because you need to remind us what your main yeah. character looked like. Yeah. And it's very sensory. Yep. Because, hey, remember when all these things happened, this is still the same clothes. Yep, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And in this in this case also, it's I had to take a break, and so the, the chapter's been a little too far apart because of this whole gallbladder thing. <laughs> so anyway, back to the back to Lee Pike Ridge. Lee Pike Ridge is a story of this boy, and I did with a friend, Joe Casebolt, float down a stream on a chunk of styrofoam. Uh, we eventually sank and things were a disaster, but it was a very different kind of a tone. We were in our baseball uniforms and it was before a, a Parks and Rec baseball game. And we ended up quite a ways away from his house and his mom found us squelching back. <laughs> you have a <laughs> game. Our, yeah. And it was, uh, it was great fun. It stuck with me. I have a very vivid memory of watching him. Well, he leaned forward. It's his fault. It's your fault, Joe. He leaned forward. I was the big kid. I was the big husky. I was husky. <laughs> I was the kid on the back of the styrofoam. He was the the small, agile kid on the front of the styrofoam, and he leaned his weight too far forward, and so it the the front rim of that styrofoam went underwater, and then the force of the current just sent us in this this dive. And I will never forget watching Joe leap for this kind of algae covered rock, and like hugging it and just sliding down, sliding <laughs> down, sliding down under the surface. And I dove the other direction and kind of like slapped belly first on the surface of the water and grabbed two big fistfuls of thistles and dragged myself up onto the bank <laughs> by means of thistles. But anyway, that's the real version. Yeah, where's the in nugget this, in this, this version? Start? In this version, it's a kid, and this is a, it's a father hunger story. A kid who has to discover his true his father's remains in every sense of the word, every sense of the phrase, I should say. And then uh, his mom is being courted by somebody he can't stand his dad's been gone for a while yeah that metaphor for the guy's lips is the thing i remember <laughs> very vividly from lips like leeches yeah <laughs> <laughs> such a good metaphor and such a it, it just works on a number of levels the, yeah. the lips like leeches yeah so. so jeffrey veach was his name his name even gets you leech, named after leech. my least favorite street in moscow idaho actually veach veach street what a terrible sorry name. any of you who live on veach i'm sorry Nothing personal. It's just the sound of that word. I just didn't like. You can let us know if you also have lips like leeches. If you live on, if your name is Veach and you have lips like leeches, so you probably a, don't like fantasy and won't be listening. Yeah, to this and, a bit of, and a bit of a bit of a turkey neck as well. Jeffrey Ve So Jeffrey Veach is pursuing Tom Hammond's mother, and Tom Hammond is upset by this, and he has found a chunk of styrofoam which he's stored under a willow tree down in this valley by the stream, and he goes and he gets on it, sneaks out of his bedroom at night and reclines on it like a viking on a pyre and floats down this slow stream looking at the stars falls asleep wakes up as he is sucked beneath the mountain and we're off on the adventure that's fun so it is not a gary paulson story right about survival in the wilderness this is not about learning to start a fire in a cave this is not about how getting gored by a moose as gary paulson loves to do with his characters yeah this is it is a discovery of what's been underneath him all the time, always. So it's a, the first thing, just like cupboards, 100 cupboards, the main character has to discover the magic of this world before the doors open. Uh, in Tom Hammond's case, he's uh, discovering the mystery and the magic of this actual world by having been eaten by it. Yeah. You know, he's going, yeah. he's going down into it. Like Jonah in The Whale, he's going down and he's gonna find all sorts of interesting things. Things that are going to stretch the imagination and strain the suspension of disbelief. You know, we find a character who's been living down there for three years because he's been stuck surviving off of his his herd of albino crawdads that it, <laughs> that it, that he tends in this dark cave. 
In other words, this is he really does journey into an underworld, the underworld, and in doing so discovers that the new world where he lives and all of his assumptions about reality have been completely false. And he's been living in this this emptiness, this loneliness of his house, which is, I really am happy about this, chained to the top of a real big rock on this ridge line. So he's, he lives in a house that's chained down to this rock so it doesn't blow off, which is something I didn't make up. That's something that is in fact done uh, in some high wind coastal situations usually where you would cable or chain your house down. I think one thing as you're describing it that is fun about this book is just the limited palette. And yeah. You're playing with a couple really fun characters, but they come in almost like a play with a, a limited number of characters where one comes in and the other leaves. You know, so you, yep. you, you just it's a, it's an easy one to focus on and track with and just enjoy the in the moment nature of Lee Pike. Yeah, it's uh and so arch- on an architectural level, I'm stealing characters from Tom Sawyer. I'm stealing a lot from the Odyssey. Right. You know, so the the whole situation. Treasure Island, right? So yeah, there's that. Of- Treasure Island's in everything I do. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... Uh, that is the topic I wanted to talk about because at first, uh, writers sometimes think, oh no, all the good stories are already told. Right. And your response to that is... Steal them. But from... Steal it. Steal almost exclusively from dead people. That's the best way to do it. Right. They can't fight back. Yeah. So there's no litigation from the and they dead. can't and they can't criticize how you did it. So <laughs> I think it would have been a little more deft if you hadn't been as overt with the right. the bed metaphor. So right. the Homer says pushing his glasses <laughs> yeah, up on his yes. nose <laughs> with one finger sniffing and pushing his glasses up. Yeah. Um his very thick glasses. Yeah. So it as far as it goes, I name different trials after different trials from the Odyssey. Tom Hammond is Telemachus. He is Odysseus's son. Right. And he is not Odysseus. He's actually the one missing his father, but he's the one who goes on a journey to find his father and discovers that, to give it away, spoiler, he is what remains of his father. Yeah. So he's the, his father's remains can most accurately be described as Tom Hammond. Yeah. Like he's, he's the one. And so it explores a lot of things that kids will just completely miss. And they don't right. care because there's there's sh- treasure, there's yeah. bad guys, there's survival, there's a brave dog. All also from the Odyssey. Yep, exactly. Named, and there's an old coot who lives next door in the farm named Nestor, named after Nestor from the Odyssey. So there's a there's a lot that I just borrow and pull in into this little quiet yeah story. And it's, well, I mean, quiet's an overstatement, but but it is contained. It's a very contained story. So why do you do that? Why does Nestor make an appearance in this story rather than say the same Coot character with a different name? Uh, why Nestor? Yeah. Because old man Nestor is a great character from the Odyssey. Yeah. And so because he makes me smile and makes me happy and he makes me smile harder than somebody whole cloth that I made up, it's, yeah. it's fun to like, it's fun to hide Easter eggs. There's a kind of, imagine walking around your house Sunday morning on on Easter with you've got a little a little kid around and you're hiding eggs with treats for them and somebody else says why don't you just give them the egg just hand it to them yeah well but it's fun to hide an egg and it's it's fun because you you hit it you know it's there and then you also get the pleasure of other people finding it and you get the to watch their pleasure in having discovered it and having uncovered something as opposed to just being handed something yeah so and I think that question. Why write I, a story at all? Right. I mean, I could just say, man, wouldn't it be great if there's a story about a kid who got sucked under, you know, under a mountain and it had a lot of Odyssean references and they could all say, yeah. And then we could say, great. Now I don't have to write it. <laughs> you know? Right. And that assumes that it's possible to avoid being part of the broader tradition. Yeah. You know, and of course it's, it's not like. Yeah. Know, stop it. Stop trying. Yeah. Every story you write about a kid who has to defend his mom in some yeah. sense is going to be part of the, well, like DSL-8 says, the tradition of, of yeah. literature. And you can't you are, avoid it. You are in that conversation and you can't not be. You cannot, as much as little POMO relativists want to be like wholly unique and original in their own moment in time, separate from all who came before. Like, yeah, good luck with that. Yeah, I used to think Solomon's There's Nothing New Under the Sun was an indictment on fiction. You know, yeah. it's, it's limited, we're running out. Yeah. But- I think it just, you misunderstand what fiction is if you, yeah. and, and in fact, many, 
if I read a pitch that doesn't work, it's often because the author was trying to be super unique with their character. Yes. Yep. Overcomplicated or over unique or right. The kid is too much of an outlier. The character is too much of an outlier, not relatable. Right. But you also, you have in all of this, you come back to the food metaphor, which is why we have once again named our podcast stories are soul food. <laughs> would you ever, would it ever make sense if somebody said, why, why would you be barbecuing that hamburger? All the hamburgers have been made. Yeah. Like every hamburger under the sun has been made. It's, it's been done. It's been eaten. And yeah. it's like, go well, find a lizard and grill it. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> but I'm hungry. And also I want to try to do this with excellence. So I am pursuing this, you know, this hamburger to the best of my abilities. And it, this is exactly how I pursue grilling, by the way. So I'm not a snob at all. I, you know, I am in fact on a gas grill with no apologies, no intention of yeah. changing. No briquettes for you? No. No chimney? And, nope. <laughs> and maybe someday. But if I make a hamburger, if I'm making hamburgers for my kids, I'm going to try to make them the best hamburgers. That's what I got to do. If I'm grilling tri-tip, I'm trying to dial it in so I'm doing it like exactly the best way I possibly can. And part of the joy for me is doing it on a little bit of a ramshackle barbecue, which I a grill. Yes, I know. Oh, um, I know. I was thinking our Texas. Yeah, suck it up, so Texas, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, and everybody uh, else too. Yeah. Everybody else who wants to be a snob about things that don't matter. Right. And I mean that it doesn't matter. But Shots it's, fired, but we will, yeah, we will so double it's like down on it. Part of the joy is coming out there and being like, oh, my stupid little thing's got hot spots and cool spots. And right. I have I'm a fourth gonna, generation gas grill. As yeah. Well, and I'm going and... to play with indirect heat. I'm using indirect heat from my tri tip in a totally erratic and unhelpful grill. And you and actually have to be careful whether you open it because it won't heat up <laughs> quite very fast. <laughs> and it's, it is, that's part of the joy. Part of the joy is, is conquering in those circumstances and making really good tri tip. Yeah. And then, uh, like, I love doing that. And so, the fact that other people have done tri-tip before me, that's just part of the pleasure. That's part of the fun. That means there's millions and millions of failures and millions of successes yeah. and things that can go right and things that can go wrong. So, I'm not deterred by the fact that all the hamburgers have been made. You know, right. I'm out there doing mine and trying to, trying to make it unique and interesting and fun and still just a hamburger, you know, yeah. that my kids love. And that is the goal and that's the goal for stories too so i'm going to take the odyssey and i'm going to repackage it for middle graders and i'm going to do it in this contained way now as far as like why there aren't wizards why i didn't go high fantasy with lee pike ridge is the answer to that is twofold one is the whole point of that book at that phase in my life was to prove that i could do something tight contained and disciplined to prove it to myself and also the publishers because I'd written this draft of the 100 Cupboards trilogy. I'd attempted it as a single volume. It was a mess. It was this blue whale bloated on the beach. And, you know, it was... It was it needed in, the dynamite. It, yeah. And about a million seagulls. It was really, really... I mean, I'm glad I did it. And it was important. It was an important step. But it had a ton of work ahead of me. And instead of trying to jump in to just grinding on that trilogy and trying to take that single volume to a trilogy i i really wanted to write something small and disciplined and focused and prove that i could hit notes and flavors and you know and do this thing so i was working on i knew that and i was working on the cupboards series at the time i was sitting there staring at it it was later in the evening i had started working at home because my wife had an old back injury that had flared up and we were having little kids and she couldn't move you know frequently i had to pull her vertical out of the chair she couldn't stand you know it was it was not a small thing she Oof. had to, she had to have a dowel that she would beat me with to get me to wake up to like go get the baby who the baby was crying and like bring the baby to nurse and then take the baby back you know it was just one of those oh wow like we were in in kind of a, a rough patch as far as health went so I was working at home and I was working on cupboards that night and she was going to bed and she asked me if I was coming to bed. I said, yes, she left. I turned the lights off in my, in the, the kid's playroom slash office. I'd put a sawhorse desk in the corner of their playroom and I went and playroom is generous. But so I went, I was brushing my teeth, dead to bed and the opening sentence of Lee Pike Ridge hit me while I was brushing my teeth. In the history of the world, there have been lots of onces and lots of times, and every time has had a once upon it. Like, okay. Like, huh, that's, that's fun. 
and I'm scrubbing my teeth, <laughs> you know, brushing my teeth. And I think, you know what? I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to wake up. I'm not going to remember that. So I ran back into the dark playroom, did not stub my toe. I was worried about it. <laughs> Dropped into my desk, opened a new doc, and typed that sentence. Both cheeks full of toothpaste, toothbrush sticking out of my mouth. And it was just sitting there staring at me. And it, so I, I kept going and I finished the first paragraph and it just kind of kept going. And around one in the morning, my wife came down and turned the light on suddenly. And I was, you know, sort of suddenly blinking and recoiling. And I was just sitting in the dark with my cheeks full of toothpaste. And I'd been there for a long time with my cheeks full of toothpaste. <laughs> and, and so as soon as she flipped the lights on, I realized the, just the grotesquerie of my situation. <laughs> You know, it's like trying to hold toothpaste in your mouth for any length of time is not fun, but it was well over an hour that I'd had to. The nerves were dead in your cheeks. (laughs) And so I suddenly was like, oh, and like jumped up and sprinted to the kitchen and spat in the kitchen sink and rinsed my mouth out. And I'd written, you know, a good chunk of the first chapter of Leap Pike Ridge with my mouth full of toothpaste. And then I went to bed. And the next morning I kept going and I was like, yeah, this is the one. This is, this is that little discipline story I've been, I've been hunting for. And so then I started mapping it out or trying to, and I at least mapped the first three chapters and wrote them, gave them to Aaron Wrench. And this was the very first moment of our relationship professionally, where I gave them to Aaron and said, hey, here in my extreme wisdom is how the publishing world works. You pitch and you get them to read these chapters. And then after a very long time, they're going to ask for the complete manuscript and you know, we'll go from there. So I've got tons of time. Don't worry about it. These are the only chapters that exist, but there will be more by the time anybody reads them. Uh, he had very quick responses from a lot of people and uh, they were all asking for the, the complete manuscript. And he told them in his highly experienced wisdom, also being a rookie, that he would have them the full manuscript in two weeks. So <laughs> then he let me know, hey, I told him, I'm going out there to visit family. I'm going to be in Philadelphia and I'll bomb into New York City and I'll hand deliver the total manuscript. And so I told him two weeks, you got two weeks. So I, man, I really had to dig in and plan the story and what I was going to do. And I finished the first draft in two weeks, emailed to him. He read it super late, you know, killed his in-laws printer, probably printed out this manuscript, drove into New York, couldn't find a parking spot, double parked outside a little copy store made a bunch of copies and drove around all the major publishing houses and slapped this manuscript hot on their desks. And it was not long a- after that we had our first offers coming in. So Leap by Ridge from that toothpaste moment to delivery was, you know, three and a half weeks to a month ish. I don't there, remember. There there, some... I don't remember how much gap there was between the three chapters getting sent off and when my two week deadline was, but there was a gap there. But then, uh, that, so the, the goal was to do something short and disciplined. And yeah, it was going to be in the same world as the other stuff I was working on, but it was focusing on a different part of it, you know, a different aspect of it. I wasn't trying to focus on the profits. I wasn't trying to focus on the wizards, the big magic. I was focusing in on the small mysteries. Yeah. Isn't there some aspect of that about some sort of crazy cab driver with that Aaron Wrench story? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's always crazy cab drivers. But <laughs> after that happened, so after we sold to Random House, there was a situation where I got invited out to sales conference, national sales conference with Random House. And again, being a rookie, didn't know that this was a thing. You know, I didn't realize how many people are trying to get published and how many people are actually getting published and how few people are showing up and things like that. So I was out there with Dan Brown. Oh, okay. And in Terrytown, New York, up above the city on the top of this little mountain and a little resort. And they you know, my editor and publisher were wanting me to present to all the sales reps for Random House and to have them get to know me and establish a relationship, et cetera, because Lee Pike was coming. And so I met my publicist for the first time at that meeting, gave a presentation, talked about my agenda, what my manifesto was, my mandate for stories, for narrative, which is basically what we talked about on this podcast, of bringing wonder, bringing an awakening of imagination, not escapism. You know, that not wanting people to resent their, their lives or their place in the world, but to actually be inspired to be better characters by what they read. And so I, I make that pitch. Everything's yay. Everything's hooray. Great time meeting people. And then I'm supposed to be getting picked up at, you know, four in the morning by a driver to be taken back to JFK. And the driver does not show up. 
Mm. And everybody's asleep, published is asleep, editor, publisher, and I'm standing outside this resort waiting. And so I call the emergency line, you know, on my little itinerary the publicist has given me. And no driver, no driver, no driver. And like tick tock, I'm gonna miss this flight home. And finally, this old guy from Brooklyn with a, in his black suit and the skinny tie and his tie knots way off to the side and ties flapping over his belly, like comes whipping up and the fishtails into the, it's raining, fishtails on wet leaves, you know, right up to the curb where I'm standing outside this, this uh, resort, slides in and jumps out and comes sprinting just to grab my bags and throw them in the back. And he, and he assures me that we will be there on time. And I have never been in as wild or as dangerous a, uh, a ride as that particular <laughs> ride. And I mean, we went over 90 on the shoulder at one point. We off-roaded in a Lincoln Town car. Like oh, wow. he, he literally turned just off the shoulder of you know a two-lane divided. I don't know if it was an interstate, but it sure was behaving like one to my Idaho mind. There's no lights or anything. We were, we were flying uh, and he just turned and went down a hillside to shortcut because an off-ramp was blocked. And so he just, and we, we reversed against 70 mile an hour traffic. <laughs> like we, did, we were, he, this guy pushed it. And most beautifully, once we off-roaded because this off-ramp connecting to the road he wanted to take was blocked and we went bouncing down a hillside and we reached the lower level on this other road. We went around a corner and there were a bunch of cop cars with their lights going blocking the way because it was flooded. And he jumped out and went and he physically grabbed a policeman, like grabbed him by the shoulders and turned him around and told him we were going through. And we hit a flooded road. Like we actually like, <laughs> the cop finally had a big fight and he finally talked the cop into it and he jumped back in and we hit water, came up over that windshield. I mean, it was- Oh my goodness. So yeah, the whole thing, I ended up calling my sister who was living in England at the time because she was the only one who was going to be conscious. The time zones went the right direction just to say goodbye. <laughs> it was also to say, I'm having the most absurd drive of my life. I was just going 95. I and mean, there are times that we took off ramps at speed, ran the stop signs at the bottom just to take the on ramp on the other side to pass traffic. I mean, oh it was just goodness. like, it was, it, was, it was ridiculous. And he got me there still, like barely. It was, he needed every second of that. And he successfully got me there and I flew home. But yeah, that was all connected to my, my first visit to big, well, to the sales conference, to my first time out there with Random House talking about Lee Pike Ridge and the, and the forthcoming launch. So then hilariously, then realism set in. It was like, that was super, super fun. That was a blast. And like right before the book came out, the publicist I'd met and who was making all the plans quit and went to work for Ralph Lauren. Ah, uh, yes, as we've- and reduxed on this podcast it's like yeah. come on come on <laughs> and all the realism started to set in like how things can go wrong and how many different ways everything has to go right in order to successfully launch a book yeah so and that's after the writing yeah that's after the writing after the editing after the publishing after the toothpaste and here it comes and now we're going to promote 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 oops <laughs> yeah <laughs> well yeah. after all the toothpaste and everything else well that's fun i think we've done our our so lee pike ridge is the odyssey and tom sawyer and does it belong in the same world as Ashtown and Sam Miracle and Cupboards? Yeah. yeah, it absolutely does. And if anybody's paying attention to the whole canon, you'll notice that each book has a, a protagonist in a different situation. And so you have people like Henry York who are you know coming into their own, coming into an inheritance that's very prophetic and Old Testament. And then you have people like Tom Hammond, where all he wants to do is figure out who his dad is, you know, and and reconnect with his father, you know, cause he's been absent from him for too long. Yeah. And then you bounce over to Sam Miracle and it's more heightened and you jump over to Ashtown and those characters are coming at it from a different, you know, a different perspective. But the world is one coherent world with many different characters and many different callings and giftings. Just like our yeah. own. Yeah, Hence. almost as if I was copying something else. <laughs> <laughs> Hence why you should like fantasy. Yeah, you have to. If you don't like fantasy, it's okay if you say I don't like bad fantasy, that's fine. Nobody can object to that. Just phrase it correctly. Don't say I don't like fantasy. Don't say I don't like God's favorite genre. Just as a, as a rule of thumb, don't do that. <laughs> that's it. All righty, peace out. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the Stories or Soul Food podcast. 
If you're someone highly invested in kid fiction and finding the best stories for your kids and you haven't downloaded the Canon app, I want to encourage you to download and subscribe today. You can find things on there such as Christine Cohen's The Winter King, Ethan Nicole's Brave Ollie Possum, Peter Lightheart's Wise Words, a book on Narnia from Douglas Wilson titled What I Learned in Narnia, and much, much more. Download the app today wherever you get your apps and subscribe.